it turns out that the reason for that is because um, is because uh, there's this elongation factor called PTFB, which is recruited uh, at the initiation complexes, but it's held in an inactive state uh, by this uh, 7SK SNRP. So this PTFB is composed of uh, a cyclin and a CDK. Uh, that kinase is responsible for uh, phosphorylating RNA polymerase, and it can't do so when this inhibitor, the 7SK uh, SNRP, is, is bound to the complex. Um, so what TAT does is TAT is also uh, brought into this transcription complex uh, along with uh, along with these uh, PTFB and 7SK components, and as transcription begins um, uh, prior to elongation, uh, at the early part of the transcript, this site called tar RNA is made, and that is the site that which is which binds both TAT and PTFB, the uh, cyclin T1 component of PTFB. So when this uh, tar RNA is first transcribed, what happens is that TAT and PTFB hop onto the RNA and in the process displacing the, the inhibitory SNRP, thereby activating the kinase to enable phosphorylation of uh, RNA polymerase. So mechanistically, that's the basic picture of how TAT has been uh, thought to operate. Now we know that there are many other components uh, that interact with, uh, uh, that are involved in this transcriptional process. Um, and uh, so it's not only these components, and people have been looking at other host factors that are involved in helping uh, TAT operate. Um, and one of the things that we did in collaboration with uh, Nevin Krogan uh, a number of years ago uh, was to look at the uh, proteome of HIV. Um, and uh, when we looked at the interacting partners of TAT, we discovered a variety of new host factors that hadn't been previously implicated. And the thing I'm going to focus on today is this set of factors here that are involved in ubiquitin, ubiquitin signaling, um, so ubiquitin ligases and other, other factors. Um, it's been known that post-translational modifications are important for TAT uh, uh, work, for example, from meloniot on acetylation and, and, uh, and other types of um, modifications show that there's more going on to TAT function that involves uh, 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 post-translational modification. So we started focusing on these ubiquitination factors, and the first question we asked was whether any of these factors might directly modify TAT itself. Um, so it's been known that TAT is ubiquitinated, ubiquitinated, and so what we did was to look at this panel of, uh, uh, of ligases and ask whether, whether any of them might directly uh, ubiquitinate TAT. And as you can see here, one of them indeed does directly ubiquitinate TAT. It's uh, PGA2. Uh, what's interesting about that ubiquitination is that it is not uh, a, a mark that leads to proteasomal degradation. It's actually a mark that, that is uh, involved in a functional aspect of TAT, not for uh, uh, affecting its uh, stability. So because of that, because we knew it was non-degradative, um, we were interested in understanding um, what kind of linkages there were. So normally the degradative linkage occurs through lyse 98 on ubiquitin, um, but since this was a non-degradative mark um, and was not involved in, in polyubiquitination uh, for degradation, we were interested in the types of linkage, linkages that ubiquitin used. And it turns out that there were uh, a few different linkages that were possible, not just a single kind of linkage, but there were actually uh, several different linkages that enabled the ubiquitination of, of TAT. So, um, uh, so there is a diversity in, in the way that uh, that, that was uh, um, uh, that, that the ubiquitination uh, chains are added. Uh, and we did that by using ubiquitin variants that had just single lysines in them so that we could tell which linkages were being utilized. So um, from the, um, uh, so the, um, uh, the interesting facet to the way that these ubiquitinations happen is that they are dependent on the scaffolding of PTFB. So in fact, there's a very marked stimulation in ubiquitination uh, when TAT is presented in the context of the PTFB complex. Um, so it is in its, in its uh, apparently functional state in the context of that, uh, in that complex. Um, so the other aspect of this ubiquitination is where on TAT do, the, do these modifications happen? Um, and through a systematic series of mutants, uh, either uh, adding, either removing lysines or adding them back from a lysineless background, what we determined is that there are three lysines that are important to re fully restore TAT activity. So there are the three lysines that become ubiquitinated, 
And what's interesting when it, about that is that there, aside from this uh, K41 residue, which is important structurally for the TAT integrity, uh, it turns out that the other lysines that could be utilized for ubiquitination and, and restore function were very variable. So as long as there were three lysines in there, that was sufficient to get, restore full TAT activity. So um, I should say um, then, so we, what we have is this picture of uh, quite a lot of diversity, both in terms of the linkages that ubiquitin uses, uh, that the ligase uses to, um, uh, to add on the ubiquitin chains, as well as the sites on TAT that are ubiquitinated. So there's quite a bit of diversity and flexibility in, in that. Um, I should say we don't know yet precisely mechanistically what the importance of these ubiquitinations are, um, but we know from uh, uh, knockout studies that this is an important factor for TAT function, um, and we're in the process of investigating that further. So as I pointed out, there were other uh, ubiquitin uh, uh, signaling proteins in the mix here, and so we were interested in what some of these others uh, might do, which ones might be, uh, again, functionally important uh, for TAT, and what were their mechanisms. Um, so what we did was, uh, again, uh, SI um, uh, RNA um, uh, experiments and found that there were a couple of these other E3 ligases that, uh, that gave very good knockdown of TAT activity, um, comparable to what you see if you knock down the components of PTFB. So these are uh, uh, important um, uh, E3 ligases for TAT function. And at the same time, we were also doing a lot of proteomic studies with a number of the TAT relevant factors, uh, one of which is hexam one which is a component of the 7SK SNRP. And it turned out that uh, when we asked for interacting proteins with hexam one you can see that ub 2 one of these ligases, came up very strongly uh, in this uh, interaction here. So hexam one is part of this complex here. Um, so, uh, we could confirm that this interaction uh, uh, was, was, was quite robust, so we can see here that ube 2 interacts very strongly with hexam-1, uh, and that's not true for this other ligase, uh, ZFP91, uh, which, again, doesn't show interaction in the mass uh, spec experiment either. So that, enabled, that, that uh, prompted us to focus on ube 2 o what was its important, what importance, what was its mechanism. Um, and so, um, so we could see, in, for example, that, uh, that one of the next facets is that TAT is, uh, uh, markedly enhances the interaction of hexam with UBE2O. So the idea is that TAT binds to UBE2O, uh, recruits it to hexam-1 and uh, to, do its, to do its job. Um, so is it, it's not just a recruitment mechanism, it's not just a, 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 a binding, um, but it's actually functionally important, as I'll show you in a second. So when we looked at the residues that were important for uh, binding of UB2O to TAT, we found that there's a little cluster of a couple of residues uh, clustered over here that are important for the interaction with UB2O uh, based on mutagenesis. And this is distinct from the re re uh, re um, region that interacts with the PTFB components or AFF1, which is a component of the super elongation complex that TAT interacts with, um, largely worked on by Chung Zhao here. Um, so we have a novel interface that's involved in interacting with, uh, with the UB2O uh, ligase. Um, so not only is the interaction uh, uh, going on, but we get robust ubiquitination of hexam one by UB2O. So you can see here that there's a very marked uh, degree of, of ubiquitination that happens uh, just by adding in vitro UB2O with, um, uh, with hex, the hexam one substrate. Uh, moreover, not only does it ubiquitinate hexam, but um, the nature of the ubiquitination is, is quite interesting. So it's again a non-degradative mark, just as it was with PGA2. Uh, and in this case, what happens is that there are multiple sites of ubiquitination of, of hexam, uh, but they're all mono-ubiquitin marks. And we know that because we can take a mutant of ubiquitin that has no lysines, so therefore is incapable of forming polyubiquitin chains, and we still get multiple sites hit on, uh, uh, that are ubiquitinated on hexam. So it's this mono-ubiquitin uh, mark at, at several different spots. Um, as with the, um, the interaction study, we find that TAT also markedly enhances the degree of ubiquitination of hexam-1 mediated by ub 20 So this appears to be a, a very robust and TAT-dependent uh, ubiquitination.
Um, so, uh, so now, what does this mean? What does the ubiquitination of hexa mean? So, what does it mean in terms of the components that we know about the 7SK SNRP and PTFB? What's the consequence of this? So, we decided to look at localization of uh, of these components. And first of all, what we found is that um, well, before we do that, what we found is that the interaction uh, of uh, uh, or the uh, um, Ubiquitination by UBE2 of hexam actually requires the RNA binding of, of, of hexam 1. So, in other words, the interaction with the SNRP is required to get ubiquitination by UBE2O. So, if we make a mutation that abolishes RNA binding, we also abolish uh, ubiquitination. Um, so, it, it happens in the context of the 7SK complex. Um, uh, furthermore, if we do a knockdown of UBE2O with siRNA, what we see is that uh, removing UBE2O actually enhances the association of both PTFB components, like this one here, LARP7, as well as PTFB, cyclin and CDK subunits. So knockdown of UBE2O inhibits uh, or, or, sorry, enhances the binding of, uh, of interaction, and that's consistent with the idea that the, that the ubiquitination actually destabilizes the components of the complex. Uh, so it destabilizes the SNRP and PTFB uh, components of the complex. So TAT recruits UBE2O, UBE2O ubiquitinates hexam that remodels the SNRP and PTFB complex. It helps to dissociate it. So what is the functional consequence of that? Well, if we look at the localization now, what we see is that uh, the PTFB and 7SK components are localized uh, very uh, markedly uh, in the cytoplasm. They're largely in cytoplasmic complexes. Um, if, we, um, if we now look at the ubiquitination status, what we see is that the, the, the ubiquitinated um, hexam is almost exclusively cytoplasmic. So the effect of what's happening of TAT-mediated um, ubiquitination of hexam through UB2O is happening uh, cytoplasmically. So what could be happening there? Why is there the cytoplasmic effect of, of, of ubiquitinated hexam? Um, and it turns out that um, uh, what it does is it actually changes the distribution of PTFB between the nucleus and the cytoplasm. So uh, when you add in TAT, which then promotes the ubiquitination of hexam, what you see is that the PTFB subunits actually decrease in the cytoplasm and the increase in the, in the, nuclear, in the nuclear compartment. So that there's a translocation upon ubiquitination of hexam of this important elongation factor, PTFB, from the nucleus, from the cytoplasm to the nucleus. And this is very reminiscent, for example, of what happens with NF-kappa B, where there's an inhibitor in the cytoplasm that gets released, and that allows translocation of NF-kappa B to the nucleus. And we think that, that this is uh, an important mechanism that's contributing to, to TAT activation. So um, that gives us uh, a, a slightly more complicated model for TAT function that we, than we had before, and I don't want to go into the details uh, it's a complicated slide. I just want to uh, indicate that it's the ubiquitination of, of, of hexam-1 that, uh, that helps to release uh, the functional PTFB subunits, and that can come in uh, and, and then help to activate transcription. We don't know the proportion of that mechanism versus how much happens by the release of uh, the, by the TAR uh, um, interaction release of the uh, SNRP, but there's a combination of these uh, couple of mechanisms that feed into the act activation pathway. Okay, so what I'd like to do, uh, so, so to, to summarize then, there are these important ubiquitination factors that ubiquitinate either TAT or a component of the SNRP that are uh, important in TAT activation, and so there are these more elaborations uh, of, of, of host components that are adding on new features to how TAT uh, is, is um, uh, taking over host complexes for, for its transcriptional purposes. Um, so what I want to switch to now uh, in the last uh, few minutes is a discussion of, of REV, which is the second regulatory protein. And the function of REV is to bind to this RNA element, the REV response element. Um, it binds this a, a ligamer um, with uh, about um, uh, six subunits of REV bound to the RNA, and that complex then interacts with the CREM1 nuclear export receptor in conjunction with RAN-GTP. That then enables export of the, of the viral RNA bound to uh, REV, 
and in the cytoplasm then the upon hydrolysis of uh, GTP by RAN uh, that complex gets released. So the RNA protein complex gets released and that can then go on to translation of the RNA or packaging of the genomic RNA. So, um, um, so what we um, have been doing as part of our, our investigation is trying to understand the structural uh, assembly of how these complexes form. And uh, to that end, um, we've been looking a lot at this oligomerization of, of REV and how it, it's important on binding to the RNA. Um, we've solved the crystal structure of REV alone, which for, turns out to form a dimer, and then re this REV dimer bound to an RNA site. And I'll talk about that in a second. Um, and then that dimer oligomerizes in ways that I'll talk a little bit about again to form a complex on this large 350 nucleotide RNA with about six REV subunits on it. Uh, the other part of REV, the other end of REV, has this nuclear export sequence peptide that engages the CREM1 uh, nuclear export sequence, uh, the CREM1 uh, um, uh, receptor. And I'll talk again a bit more about that. So what I want to focus on a little bit is this idea of how the dimer is arranged. And in particular, I'm going to focus on this idea that these interactions, as you'll see, are, are actually quite flexible or, or plastic. So if we look at, uh, at the REV dimer, what we see are these uh, um, subunits that are arranged with, uh, with this sort of architecture with a little hydrophobic core uh, in the middle to paste the dimer together. And these are the RNA binding domains of the protein. Um, if you bind RNA and look at the crystal structure of that, what you see is that there's a rather dramatic rearrangement of this dimer architecture um, where the hydrophobic core repacks and then gives a very different crossing angle to these, uh, to these dimers. So we have this picture of Rev being able to, to really torque around this dimer interface uh, and maybe arrange itself in, in different ways depending on what it's interacting with, what its partner is. Um, so, there, and I should point out that there are other arrangements of this REV-REV interface uh, that have been observed in other crystal structures. So there's this very dynamic or plastic or flexible behavior to the assembly of the oligomer. Um, furthermore, if we look at how the protein interacts with the RNA, uh, we have seen now a few different examples of different subunits of REV binding to different portions of the RNA. As I said, there are six REV subunits and they're binding to different parts of the RNA. And we can see, at least in these three cases that we know something about, um, that the way that the RNA interacts with the protein differs at all three sites. So in all cases, it's this arginine-rich helix that is the RNA binding domain of the protein, but the way that the RNA surrounds that helix is different at this site and this site. There are different arrangements of the subunit uh, of the uh, uh, interface and the different, and different side chains being used. Uh, and here at this one, we don't have a structure yet, but there's a, an engagement of this opposite side of the alpha helix on one of the other subunits. So the protein is organized with this plasticity, both in its in its protein-protein interface and in its protein-RNA interface that enables it to form this large uh, RNP particle on the, on the RNA. Um, so this plasticity, the way that these oligomers are arranged, the way the RNA binding surface is arranged, is of course read out in the context of a host protein interaction. Um, and uh, we have a, a low resolution EM structure, which is now about to become a high resolution through cryo EM, um, which shows that what happens is that CREM actually forms a dimer where the REV RNA particle, uh, this is now six, the six subunits of REV bound to this large uh, 350 nucleotide RNA, that now actually drapes across this dimer of CREM1. And this was an interesting finding because CREM1, which exports a lot of protein cargoes through an NES peptide, uh, has only been seen before as a monomeric protein that, 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 uh, that takes out more monomeric cargoes. So we don't yet know if this dimerization is something that's unique to HIV or whether this is maybe reflective of uh, other kinds of host cargoes uh, that haven't bet, been uh, yet uh, elucidated. So we'll know more about this as we get to high resolution, uh, but the, this dimerization aspect is something that, that helps to engage the RNA protein complex in its, uh, in its proper state. So, um, so, you know, this picture of REV that's been developing is one of, you know, a lot of plasticity, a lot of moving parts. Um, and so we were very curious about how the protein evolves. How does it evolve to have these different components and allow for this flexibility? 
And so um, uh, a previous student in the lab, Jason Fernandez, who's in the audience, um, did this uh, experiment where um, he, well, let me back up for a second. Another level of complexity to this, to this flexibility is that REV in the context of the virus is not on its own, but it actually has overlapping reading frames with two, uh, with two other proteins, TAT being one and envelope being the other. So the protein has to evolve this plasticity in these different parts, not only for itself, but in the context of whatever constraints these other re reading frames impose on the protein. So what Jason did was he made viruses that actually separated out the two, the, the, over, the overlapping reading frame. So he constructed viruses with Rev and TAT in different places, uh, and then exhaustively looked at every possible mutation uh, of, of each of these reading frames and determined the fitness values for every single uh, position. And there were two rather interesting findings from that. One is that um, although there were um, amino acids in the sequence that were overlapping and looked to be conserved in patient isolates for both proteins simultaneously, it turns out that when you look functionally, the, these uh, residues that are uh, overlapping are only important for one protein or the other. And the only reason that they apparently look conserved for the protein in the opposing reading frame is because of codon usage, that there, it restricted the codons that could be used when actually it's not conserved, it's not actually conserved for a functional reason. Um, so that was rather interesting. And the other aspect is that the overlap arrangement, when you start putting back um, functional sequences together and look at what codons are, are con compatible, it turns out that uh, about half of the um, uh, arrangements uh, that where, you, where you're trying to fit together functional sequences, about half of the viruses that you can reconstruct are actually unfit for replication. So have, having the overlapping reading frame actually eliminates about half of the unfit allele. So at a population level, there's actually a selective advantage to having these overlapping reading frames, which we really didn't expect. It's a little bit counterintuitive. So, um, so from this deep analysis, from this exhaustive analysis, um, what we have been now able to focus on are other regions of the protein uh, that are not known to be important functionally or, or structurally. So these are the regions that are functionally and structurally important in color here. But there are these other regions of the protein that we have a lot of sequence information about, uh, particularly the N and C termini, uh, this turn region between the helices here, and this linker region between the oligomerization domain and the nuclear export sequence. So that enabled us to now begin to ask some more detailed questions about how these regions might play into the flexibility of the protein, to the function of the protein. Are there, re are there things uh, that are unexpected about those regions? And I'm gonna give three real quick snapshots of some of the things that we've learned about these regions. So first of all, at the termini, uh, what we found is that if we look, for example, at the N-terminus, that we have, we can delete 10 residues th to the N-terminus and it's perfectly functional, in this case in an export assay or in a replication assay, perfectly happy uh, virus, perfectly happy function. However, when we look at the levels of protein produced, they're very, very low compared to wild type. So making the deletion mutation has no effect on function, but dramatically reduces the amount of protein expressed. So there's an effect on stability based on, on that, even though it's functionally still important. Uh, the same holds true at the C-terminus. If we make C-terminal deletions, again, we see this very marked drop in the amount of protein expressed, but perfectly happy replication, perfectly happy um, uh, export uh, activity. Uh, and that's further supported by the fact that in, that in our selection experiment, we found that in fact there's a slight enhancement of, of stop codons that are um, uh, in the C-terminal region that make more fit viruses. So there's actually a selective advantage to having uh, 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 C-terminal deletions in the, in the virus. Um, so both of these um, deletion studies point to the fact that the stability of the protein is probably controlled and we're looking at uh, aspects that actually control that to keep REV levels uh, in check so that uh, it, it maximizes replication. Um, the second region uh, that I wanna talk about briefly is this turn region. Um, and this is a region where uh, we've been able to make other sorts of substitutions, uh, wholesale substitutions with polyalanine or glycine serine stretches. And we end up with, um, uh, with 
uh, with very reasonable reporter activity, but if we look in, in the virus context, we see that there's a very marked decrease in, in, the, in, the, uh, um, uh, in, the, in the viral in viral replication. So this is a case where there's a mismatch between what we see in the export assay and the virus replication assay, and that implies that there may well be some other functional importance to this little turn region interacting perhaps with other host factors that are important for rev function in the virus context, but not necessarily for RNA export, and we're looking at those as well. And then finally, um, the region between the oligomerization domain and the nuclear export sequence, again, through these uh, gross substitutions, putting in um, alanines or glycines and serines, we found that these alanine mutations work perfectly well. So you, there are a lot of ability to change the sequence around, but a clear preference to have helical propensity there. And that also tracked in the context of the virus as well. So we can infer from that that this is likely a helical region that extends from, uh, this, uh, from this oligomerization domain and makes it a, a longer helix. So uh, to wrap up then, um, that, that structural uh, implication is that uh, this, uh, we could then sort of build in that extra bit of helix and then that way in which that protein would engage the CREM1 dimer has certain restrictions because of that, that rigidity of that sequence. And we don't know yet the structural detail of that. We're working, working on the cryo-EM structure of this complex. Uh, so we'll see what arrangements are possible uh, given that there are six rev subunits, but only two NESs and two binding sites on, on CREM. Um, so with that, I'd like to thank a uh, number of people, in particular uh, Tyler and Young, who've done a, a lion's share of the, of the TAT work. Um, Bargavi, who's at the meeting today, um, and, and Jason, who's uh, now a postdoc down at Santa Cruz, is at the meeting today as well um, for their work on REV. Um, and I thank you. Any questions? Okay, well, I'll start with one. So going back to the first half of the talk, I don't know if we have a, maybe I can throw the mic. Sure. Oh, there we go, thank you. Okay, so I was curious about the, the ubiquitin addition that was non-degradative uh, but had an effect on X and 1. So you said you don't know exactly how that works yet, but do you have any speculation as to what's, what's going on there, what's the mechanism, what's going on, or how are you going to look at that? Right, so, so with the hexam, we have a little bit of more of a clue because it does seem to be, in, in, sorry, with the hexam, we have a little bit more of a clue because it does seem to be important in the, um, in the disruption of the interaction, both with the 7SK SNRP and with PTFB. So the, the simple idea is that it, it helps to dissociate that complex, and then the PTFB that's released can translocate from the cytoplasm into the nucleus. So we think it's, it's, it's a disruptor of that interaction. Uh, your model showed that uh, your model showed that uh, that the old axon and it binds to a tau. Uh, the axon will be to O S nucleus. Now my question is: Is it binding of to tau, or is it because of um, well, we don't know the we don't know the answer to that. What I could say is that the um, the disruption by uh, of 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 hexam from PTFB mediated by its ubiquitination um, is probably happening both in the cytoplasm and in, in the nucleus. So we see UBE two O in both in both compartments. Um, the, um, the, the predominant form of hexam, uh, almost all of the hexam that is ubiquitinated is cytoplasmic. So we think that it's actually, that the ubiquitination is, is influencing, um, the ubiquitination of hexam is influencing its compartmentalization. Even if it's happening in the nucleus, it's being released and, and being then trapped in the cytoplasm. So we think both mechanisms are, are sort of operating simultaneously. We don't know the relative, you know, No, no, not not for not for not for ubiquitination of 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 hexam. Right, that's right. Okay, any other questions? Yes. No. 
Well, we're, we're, well, there, there has to be a little bit left. So, so, so um, no, we've been scratching our head about uh, over this. And, and we think what it reflects is the fact that um, there is a control point that, that keeps rev under some, some limit of, of expression. And that's, um, uh, and, and when you have the NNC termini, you can presumably keep, either keep rev in an inhibited state or an inactive state. But if you then um, uh, uh, make a deletion, uh, you end up affecting rev stability to keep its level low. So we suspect that, there, that there's some other control point that this is uncovering that actually keeps rev expression low. And we do know from experiments that we've done a long time ago that if you overexpress rev, you actually inhibit virus replication. And the simple idea there is if you make too much rev, what you're doing is you're now exporting unspliced RNAs uh, very efficiently to the cytoplasm at the expense of spliced RNAs. So what effectively you do is you make a TAT, a, 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 you phenocopy a TAT defect because you can't make enough TAT if all you're doing is, is transporting the, spliced, uh, the unspliced RNAs out. So we think that there's got to be a control mechanism to keep the amount of rev under control. Thank you.